The fundamental driver of the world's demand for energy is about two things. It's about population growth. In the time since I've been on the planet, which is about 50 years, the population has doubled from 3 billion to 6 billion. And in the next 30 years, it will increase by another 33 billion people. So the first driver is population growth. And the second driver is people want to have a higher quality of living. So, you know, over the next couple of decades, there are somewhere between one and two billion people will move from a rural way of life to an urban way of life. Can I tell you a little story? Sure. It's a, my, 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 my energy story. So 20 years ago, as a young geologist, I lived in Beijing. And I wasn't allowed to drive, so I had a young guy as a driver. And he lived with his wife and very young son and parents in a two-roomed hut. And they had a coal brazier and two kerosene lamps. That was their energy consumption. Last summer, I took my family back to Beijing. Same driver, still working for BP, still as a driver. We spent two weeks in Beijing doing the Olympics. At the end of it, he said, come and see my new apartment. So I went to his new apartment, his underground car park with his Chinese-built car in the basement. We get out on the 18th floor. This is his wife's electric scooter on the landing. We go into the apartment. It's a three-bedroom apartment. It's got heating for the winter, air conditioning for the summer. It's got a big American-style fridge, freezer, bigger than anything <laughs> we've got in the Hayward household. There's a flat-screen TV on the wall of the kitchen, small one. There's an enormous flat-screen TV on the wall of the lounge. And there's a flat-screen TV on the wall of each one of the bedrooms. That man, still doing the same job he was 20 years ago, but think about his energy consumption, you know, for two things. It's a tremendous testament to what China has done lifted 350 million people out of poverty. But the energy consumption that goes with that is extraordinary. You know, his energy consumption is exponential relative to what it was only 20 years ago. Yeah. And the great news is 350 million people have done that. The slightly more disconcerting thing is another one or two billion to go, if you add up with China and India and Africa. So that's, you know, <laughs> that's the energy challenge, and that's why we need all of it. Right. It's not either or, it's all of it. And the transition to a uh, much lower carbon intensity world will take place over three or four decades. So the natural transition in the vehicle fleet is energy efficiency, biofuels, hybrids, electrification over the next 20 to 30 years. The, the interesting thing in the auto industry over the last 30 years, through technology, they've increased the efficiency of the internal combustion engine by one or two percent a year. That has not translated into more miles per gallon. It's translated into bigger cars that go faster. So, you know, the whole drive behind the current US administration policy is to translate that technology and efficiency into efficiency of the fleet. There's nothing in that that is not uh, achievable today in terms of the technology. We need to do some development of some of the technology, but it's not like it's a big step out. Right. It's development, it's not research. And we will see in, you know, I don't know, five to ten years' time, the average miles per gallon of the auto fleet being north of 35, probably closer to 50. How does that transition look from biofuels on through to other options? We will see progressive penetration of biofuels into the fuel transport pool. And, you know, people have different views of how fast and to what extent. It seems reasonable that 20% over the next 20 years is sort of for sure, and it could be as high as 30%. Uh, and it will be not uh, ethanol from corn biofuels, but it'll be ethanol and probably butanol from ultimately lignocellulosic, that's normal sort of plant material. So th there's going to be a big, big impact on the um, gasoline pool. The electricity demand is already more steep in there total energy demand, and then you start to put it into cars. Yeah. What are some of the challenges? Well, so, that, you know, there's no point going to... The, the obvious thing is that there is no point moving the vehicle fleet from uh, gasoline or biofuels to electricity unless we've created a low-carbon source of power. Uh, and that, I think, is why it's 20 or 30 years away. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the, the problem with hybrids is that they're expensive, because you've got to have two drives. So then you, we're never going to create the $5,000 hybrid car because you've got to have two, tri two trains, two drives, and that, you, know, you can't do that. So, so uh, you know, hybrids will be a part of it, and they'll be a part of it for the 
uh, more expensive end of the car fleet, but they won't be a part of it for the lower end of the car fleet. Do you see us ever putting compressed natural gas into vehicles? I think that's unlikely. The, the reason I say that is that it requires a whole new system of infrastructure to be put in place. The route that I've articulated, you can go down using existing infrastructure. So you don't have to start building compressed natural gas, gas stations all over the country. Now, there are some parts of the world that will happen, some parts of the world it already has happened. You know, BP has a big compressed natural gas business in Cairo. But I don't think we'll see it develop as the principal form. I think we'll see that develop in some niche urban locations. You mentioned earlier things that could substitute for liquid fuels in vehicles. Biofuels, you mentioned electrifying the fleet, compressed natural gas. Let's start with biofuels. OK, so the, the corn-based ethanol it has two problems, well, three problems, probably. Firstly, it's expensive. So it only really works when the oil price is very high, you know, knocking $100 a barrel, and it's, it's competitive. Anything less than that, and it isn't. The second is, of course, it is a food crop, and it will only grow on land that uh, you can grow food crops on. So it does compete with food. And the third, because it's a food crop, in that sense, it uses a lot of water. So it's not a very good crop to make biofuels. In the tropical regions of the world, there's a far better crop called sugarcane. And ethanol from sugarcane in Brazil is commercial at $40 a barrel. It can be grown on poor quality land. Uh, and whilst it requires water, clearly, there's quite plenty of water in Brazil. But it's not a case of having to knock down rainforests to grow sugarcane. So today, in today's world, the best form of biofuels is ethanol derived from sugarcane. There's a lot of development, technology development going on today to seek second and third generation biofuels. That's about two things. It's about what the feedstock is and what molecule we should be using. Because the problem with ethanol, it's not a very good molecule. It's not very energy intensive and it attracts water. So it's not very good in terms of putting it into an internal combustion engine or putting it into the infrastructure that we have available to distribute gasoline. So there are two, two big pushes in the world today. One is to find a different feedstock, and the big push is into so-called lignocellulosic material. You're better to think of them as energy grasses. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are, effect I mean, essentially, they are temperate sugar cane. That's what it looks like. Long, thin stalks. It has high sugar density in the cell walls of the plant. Escanthus, which is one of, the, one of these energy grasses, or some other forms of energy grasses, can basically grow on land that's unsuitable for growing much else on. And, and, and you know, surprisingly, you don't need very much water either. So they're, they're, they're sort of ideal. A gallon of biofuels from that, that um, f source has about 70 to 80 percent of the energy of a gallon of gasoline. Okay. But the CO2 budget, of course, is dramatically different, dramatically different. So net-net, uh, plant to wheels, reservoir to wheels, there's about a 90 percent reduction in the CO2 emissions associated with the process and utilisation of a gallon of biofuel produced in that form versus a gallon of conventional hydrocarbon. And the challenge is not the technology that can turn it into ethanol, but to scale up that technology. So you can do it on the laboratory bench. And the challenge is to find the right balance of enzymes and processing to allow you to go from the laboratory bench to commercial production. Uh, my view is that will happen over the next five years or so. The peak for oil will be driven by demand, not by supply. There's plenty of oil in the world. As we've um, discovered and used a trillion barrels. We've got another trillion barrels of proven reserves, and beyond that, there's probably a trillion barrels that are not yet commercial. And beyond that, there's plenty of unconventional oil sources. Right. So the issue is not about supply. The issue is about at what level will demand peak at, driven by the transition from oil to other forms of energy? And, you know, there's a, a range of views, probably somewhere between 95 and 105 million barrels a day would be my guess. That's okay. against today's level of about 85 million barrels a day. And sometime in the next 20 years, probably, we'll see the peak of oil driven by a peak in demand.
So if you look at the oil market, I, I think there's a couple of interesting things you can say. The first thing is if you look at the price that's necessary to bring on uh, the unconventional or the more difficult oil in the deep water, the tar sands of Canada, it's pretty clear that that needs an oil price of $60, $70 a barrel. Otherwise, it's not commercial. People won't invest into it. So that's one side of the supply equation. And it's stable. And, and it would be nice if it was stable, yeah. but, you know, it would probably be unreasonable to expect right. that. You know, the, the industry's got used to volatility and, and deals with it, I would say, pretty well. Uh, the second thing is that if you look at the OPEC world, then it's pretty clear that they also need 60 or $70 a barrel, not, not to develop the oil, but to be able to invest in today's production capacity, maintain their social investment programs, their, balance their budgets, basically, and invest into tomorrow's capacity. So both in the OPEC and non-OPEC world, on the supply side, you can say $60 $70 a barrel is what's necessary to get the next generation of oil to the market mm -hmm. and have the investment. I think on the demand side for oil, it's quite interesting because if you know we've we've seen this tremendous price um, rise and fall in the last three or four years, it was very interesting all the way th up through ninety odd dollars a barrel. There was no change in demand, so consumers were very happy to have prices up sort of through ninety dollars a barrel. As soon as it went over hundred, consumer behaviour changed. It changed quite dramatically and quite quickly. So it it, it looks from a consumer's side of thing from the demand side of the equation that oil prices are pretty inelastic up through ninety dollars and north of a hundred they're very elastic so you know you can make a very coherent argument I, th I think that you know on the demand side anything north of ninety doesn't work and on a supply side anything south of sixty doesn't work you know sixty to ninety now, who, who knows how the world will work out but that's what the that's what the basics of the supply and demand equation you're very positive on natural gas how do you see natural gas supply and demand as we move out into the future? The fundamental drivers for gas demand are about population and um, increasing living standards. Where is the supply coming from? The supply is coming from uh, two places. There are some very large gas fields that are now being developed that are distant from their markets. And they're developed through uh, this process called liquefying natural gas. You compress it and chill it, turn it into a liquid, shift it across the ocean, get it to its marketplace, heat it back up again, turn it into gas and distribute it. Conventional that's, gas. That's conventional yeah. gas. The second big source of gas today is so-called unconventional gas, which is the development of either coal bed methane, which has its you know, methane from coal seams, or shale gas, which is gas that comes, um, is produced in low rates from a particular form of shale. And, uh, I think what's, what's happened in the industry over the last 10 years, there has been enormous technology strides to open up those two forms of gas. There are two key technologies for this shale gas. One is the ability to drill long step out horizontal wells, where you sort of go down initially vertically and then turn horizontal and you drill a long distance horizontally. The, the second is uh, what's referred to as fracturing, where you, using water and pressure, you effectively fracture the rock, which allows the gas to flow out at a higher rate than it would otherwise do. Uh, and there is some quite legitimate concern about the quantities of water that are used in areas where water is not freely available and the way in which it's treated and then disposed of. So I think, you know, the challenge for the industry is to demonstrate to the regulators that we're doing this in a very responsible way. The technology that allowed that resource to be developed in the US initially will, over time, over the next five to ten years, be transported to the world. And again, it will transform the world's gas resources and, and what we think of as in terms of commercial gas resources for the world. I have no doubt that there is uh, sufficient resources in the world to meet the demands of the world. The, the, so the issues aren't geological, they're human, they're political. So they're, you know, what I say is the issues aren't below ground, they're above ground. You know, we, we need to keep working the interconnectedness of the energy markets. That, that's the, gr the greatest enabler of ensuring that energy supplies are available to all, are free trade and global markets. Because that will allow energy to flow from where it's abundant to where it's needed. You know, and, and the fact is that there is a disconnect between the centres of energy consumption 
and the centres of energy supply. They're not in the same place today. So continuing to encourage free and open energy markets is the biggest enabler of energy security. Absolutely. Looking out to 2030, maybe 2050, what percentage of the total energy mix do you see in a, in a non-fossil fuel? Globally? Well, I, th I, th I think um, you know, if you include things like hydro and all of the other non-fossil fuels today, yeah. the answer today is you know, somewhere between, I think, 15 and 20 percent. And uh, the answer in 20 or 30 years will be somewhere north of 30 percent, but it won't be north of 40 percent. That, 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 I think, is pretty well locked in. I think it's very difficult to make rapid changes because of the scale of the investment. You know, the thing that many people fail to recognise in the energy industry, the energy industry globally invests a trillion dollars a year, a trillion dollars every year goes in to providing the energy the world needs. So to shift the installed capital base of that trillion dollars every year takes an enormous amount of investment over a long time. You can't sort of do it overnight. I do think that there is a, there's a role for everyone in the energy industry to be a little more less secretive a little more transparent about the realities of the energy industry, what it does, what it can do, wh where the challenges are, and to explain to people where we are and the role we play and what the future looks like. Uh, and I think if we can do that well, then uh, the public will form the right view because actually, you know, people are pretty smart. Pretty actually. smart, they? Sort of, <laughs> you know, common sense normally wins the day. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, if they have the right material yeah, and education. Absolutely. So it is about, you know, how do you, how do we ensure that the people who really matter, which is the public at large, understand the issues and are able to uh, indicate to the people who are running the show which way they should go.